Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shruti Mahalingaya, and I am a fertility doctor at the Massachusetts General Hospital Fertility Center, and I have a small clinic for women with ovulation disorders, PCOS, which we're going to talk about today. I'm so excited to um, participate in this um, Resolve New England family building conference and share some of these insights with you, and I look forward to hearing your questions either um, live or in follow-up um, through Kate Weldon LeBlanc. I'm going to share my slides with you today um, in order to talk a little bit more about this. The title of the talk is PCOS and Fertility, What Patients Need to Know. What is PCOS? Polycystic ovary syndrome is defined by um, the presence of at least two of the three following criteria, irregular or absent periods, which is due to rare or infrequent ovulation, androgen excess, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, and polycystic ovary morphology on ultrasound. How common is polycystic ovary syndrome? How many people have this? Well, population estimates have ranged over time from uh, 6.5% up to 20% in multiple different studies. Um, the recent increase in prevalence, it's unknown whether that's due to changes in dietary, nutritional, behavioral factors, or we are able to detect um, the syndrome better through better screening, more presentations of patients to their doctors. Um, and that's something that we do need to learn a little bit more about. What are irregular periods? Um, this is often a question I get asked. Um, and the um, one of the discrete definitions, and it really is a needs to be interpreted in the context of year individual health status is fewer than eight periods a year that are ovulatory. Um, there are several ways to keep track of your own cycles. Historically, menstrual record charts were handed out in clinic to keep track of bleeding days and potential ovulation days. Now there are um, a plethora of tracking applications that patients bring to me so we can kind of get a sense of uh, bleeding days and understanding menstrual cycle lengths and the potential for ovulation. What is androgen excess? So this is a second feature of polycystic ovary syndrome and androgen excess can manifest clinically as the experience of acne, hirsutism, which means excess facial or body hair, or alopecia, um, loss of hair on the head that is not attributed to other endocrinopathies or um, issues, health issues. These illustrations here are um, different illustrations showing the severity of certain types of hirsutism or here upper lip hair from not you know, zero to a score of four, which is the most um, hirsute um, shown here is um, acne, which is inflamed, cystic, and across um, all areas of the face. And then um, alopecia going from no to um, grade three. And this is illustrated by a medical illustrator for a research project. This just gives a sense of kind of the variety of ways people can experience androgen excess. Some people don't have any symptoms of androgen excess. And in those people, we check blood tests um, to understand if there is an elevation in the hormones of testosterone and, um, and um, other hormones that can promote androgenic symptoms from the adrenal glands and other glands in the body. So lastly, the third feature is polycystic ovarian morphology on ultrasound. So this is a transvaginal ultrasound image of an ovary. And um, this ovary is demonstrating a type of polycystic ovarian morphology appearance, which means there are follicles, which are these circles here, 
And anyone who comes in for a pelvic ultrasound or who has fertility monitoring is probably familiar with these. Um, the follicles can have terminology synonymous with follicular cysts or multiple cysts. Typically every follicle or follicular cyst contains an egg that's floating in the fluid and on ultrasound that fluid is black. Um, the challenging thing is that please don't diagnose yourself. Um, there is a count that needs to happen for both sides of the ovary and this count needs to be interpreted in the context of your menstrual cycles. Um, and young healthy women or women with um, uh, a robust ovarian reserve, people with ovaries that have robust ovarian reserve can have ovaries that appear to be polycystic, but are not indicative of the syndrome because you need to have the other um, findings to really be concerned for the syndrome. And that's a conversation you would have with your treating um, physician. But I wanted to show you what that looks like. There are different criteria for the diagnosis, and um, there are three main um, criteria. One is the National Institutes of Health, one is called Rotterdam Criteria, and another one is proposed by the Androgen Excess Society for the diagnostic criteria of PCOS. And typically we use Rotterdam, which is any two out of the three um, uh, features that I mentioned of rare or absent periods, um, due to rare ovulation, androgen excess features, and polycystic ovarian morphology on ultrasound. Um, when we get more strict with the criteria, such as that um, shown by the NIH, which requires all three, um, we um, do, don't include as many people for the potential diagnosis, which can help for research studies. Um, and which can maybe limit our ability to counsel and treat um, on a clinical level. So just keep that in mind when you're speaking with your provider in terms of what criteria they might use. Polycystic ovary syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, the main reason for that is multiple other endocrinopathies can, be, um, can mimic the, um, the constellation of sy symptoms seen with polycystic ovary syndrome. And those other diagnoses include disorders of the thyroid gland, pro, um, disorders of prolactin, typically prolactin excess or hyperprolactinemia, and that's from the pituitary gland, um, pregnancy, um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, issues with um, androgen secreting tumors, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, which can mimic uh, PCOS and other syndromes. So it's important to have a full evaluation, including a history, physical exam, and blood work to understand if it's not PCOS, what is the underlying etiology? Or sometimes it could be concomitant, both um, there might be some slight thyroid or prolactin abnormality, but there still is an underlying ovulation disorder that is PCOS. And shown here in this image is just the complex whole body signaling that has to happen from the brain to the pituitary to the ovaries and then back again in a feedback cycle to facilitate um, the signaling required for ovulation and um, the menstrual cycle. The reason why it's important to you understand whether or not there is an ovulation disorder like PCOS underlying a fertility diagnosis is because this diagnosis can have an impact on cycles related to fertility success. Um, there are typically fewer menstrual and ovulatory cycles per year and that thereby limits the chances you, a person has of ovulating and, and having that egg fertilize. So there are fertility implications. There's also implications for uterine health and endometrial health. Um, so the fewer cycles per year um, can be related to endometrial overgrowth called hyperplasia. And in some cases, endometrial cancer risk. I don't wanna overly concern the audience today, but in the setting of fewer than four ovulatory periods per year, which has gone, gone on for at least four to five years in a row, there is concern for estrogen exposure or um, overexposure to estrogen without that progesterone, which occurs after ovulation to balance the endometrial lining and allow it to shed. 
So that's something that we talk about in my clinic and I encourage you to, to talk about and reflect on your cycle history um, and share with your provider. There are also um, implications for pregnancy and future health um, in the setting of a diagnosis of PCOS. Usually some of those future health um, drivers are higher um, risk of obesity and type two diabetes, hypertension, um, these can kind of be a constellation of, of um, issues that can lead to metabolic syndrome. And while we know that dietary and lifestyle management is a main um, intervention and risk reducing, reducing factor, it can be very challenging so starting on um, programming for lifestyle um, and health optimization early is very important throughout your reproductive um, years as well as after. So this is a little bit about the counseling um, that's really important to understand for um, health risks with PCOS in terms of the uterus, fertility, and future health. And this grid kind of summarizes the um, totality of that um, for the uterus. We talked a little bit about this um, for ovulatory periods or progesterone induced withdrawal periods per year. That's something easy um, to do uh, with the oversight of a physician or care provider. And in terms of fertility, um, there are multiple options for supporting fertility in the setting of ovulatory infertility, as well as um, promoting the best chances of cycle success. Um, that includes, uh, first line includes lifestyle interventions, including um, dietary, uh, monitoring, uh, physical activity, at least 30 minutes a day of anything, um, a healthy balanced diet, including fruits and vegetables, meal balancing, um, lifestyle management, including circadian rhythm, um, approaches to sleep hygiene and um, having a bedtime routine, kind of consolidating that sleep, avoiding um, late night eating as well, falling right into approaches for ovulation support. And those can include ovulation induction, with pills such as letrozole or clomiphene citrate, clomid, um, with uh, timed intercourse or intrauterine insemination, and understanding um, how you respond to that and whether monitoring needs to happen to really understand what further support might facilitate ovulation, such as a uh, trigger injection um, to really promote ovulation and timing of that insemination or intercourse. And moving on to procedures that are um, uh, like in vitro fertilization. And for some um, patients, we can consider ovarian drilling, which is a more um, rarely used intervention, but uh, quite efficacious within the first six months of the surgical procedure. So I just wanted to get back into the menstrual cycle um, and understanding how ir irregular periods can affect fertility. And shown here is kind of what we all have maybe seen in our high school grade health classes. Um, this um, image shows the menstrual cycle from day one, which is the first day of bleed, all the way through day 28, which is an average cycle length. This can be much longer um, and more irregular in women with ovulation disorders and PCOS um, beyond 35 days, beyond 45 days, and sometimes um, even shorter, less than 10 days, less than 21 days due to um, dysfunctional bleeding at the endometrium. So in the proliferative phase of the menstrual cycle, those follicles, the follicular cysts um, that we, we saw on the outside, uh, periphery of the ovary are um, stimulated under the anterior pituitary's secretion of LH and FSH. These are some of the same hormones given during the ovulation induction um, treatment cycles. And that is to really promote the development of one dominant follicle that ovulates. And that's shown right here. And we might start out with over um, 10 follicles on each side, sometimes over 20 follicles. And it's really hard to control which follicle establishes dominance and ovulates. And that's why sometimes ovulation induction is just hard to do for very um, robust um, women with, and people with ovaries that with robust ovarian reserve. Once ovulation happens, the cells supporting the um, egg 
turn into the corpus luteum and secrete progesterone, which is really important to balance the lining and facilitate um, maturation. And if there's no conception, a period will happen and that lining is shed. Um, the phases of the endometrial lining are called um, proliferative and secretory. If we're thinking about it from the ovary perspective, it's called follicular and luteal. So you might hear these during your um, evaluation and treatment. If we take a look at the endometrium, um, we see in the proliferative phase that there is um, early growth of that lining under um, the influence of estrogen. And when very few or rare periods occur, um, that endometrium is just in that constant proliferative phase. Under the influence of progesterone, there is growth of the nuclei, the cells differentiate, there are more spiral arteries that develop to bring nutrients to that implanted embryo to grow the placenta and bring nourishment to that um, growing um, implantation. So when I see a patient in the clinic, I do ask, when was your last period? And it really helps to track. We talked a little bit about this before. And it helps to know when did that irregularity start? Is it due to other factors like stress, change of environment, something that um, we might be able to support without um, major treatment um, and that's part of it. Um, the other thing is once it, there is a diagnosis of PCOS, if you are tracking your period and you have PCOS, it can be really challenging to identify the LH surge despite the tracking and maybe even urinary um, test kits called ovulation predictor kits or LH strips. And um, if you're tracking your symptoms, they might not be as predictive of um, ovulation as in women with regular cycles. So it can be very fr frustrating. And here's some things um, that can be helpful beyond um, tracking is uh, a monitored cycle. And so here I just show um, some of the multiple trackers that are available to track your bleeding days, to track your symptoms, um, pain symptoms, um, some women call this cis-related pain, ovarian pain, mood shifting, cravings. You know, sometimes they're really reliable and reproducible and um, cycle to cycle indicate ovulation in some women and that's called meliminal symptoms. And sometimes it's hard to really use these as a guide. And so the other area of potential frustration for tracking ovulation at home in women with um, PCOS of varying severity is that Oftentimes, ovulation is monitored by LH kits, and LH can be tonically elevated in women with PCOS, so it will turn the urinary strip positive, or it will fluctuate with a kind of in the positive range and out, giving um, hard to interpret um, answers. It's either one stripe, two, you might get almost ovulatory, depending on the digital readout that you use, and um, it's just very challenging, and this gets at some of the um, dysregulation and signaling between the brain and the ovarian response and vice versa. So in typical ovulation, there needs to be a slight, um, uh, uh, sorry, an elevation in estradiol uh, to peak level sustained for 50 hours. And that um, results in an LH surge, which is sustained for 10 to 12 hours. And that um, is then followed up with ovulation ovulation occurs and the egg only lasts for about 36 hours. It degenerates really quickly. So that's where intercourse timing is very helpful. And so for women struggling at home, unable to really determine and detect when that LH surge is happening, when is ovulation happening, um, it, it can really help to come in for an evaluation and, and monitoring to know what your physiology is. This is a BMI chart. I like to discuss BMI um, in the setting of fertility. And there is a green zone here. And just like a very simple take home message is if you can move from the red zones into the green, you can gain almost 10 percentage points um, towards um, improved cycle specific fertility. Um, that's my pager, excuse me. We'll get back to that in just a moment. 
Um, I wanted to discuss also um, the importance of understanding pregnancy related risk for women with PCOS, which is um, both driven by the physiology and the risk factors um, that can be due to genetic predisposition, such as for type uh, gestational diabetes and type two diabetes, but also driven by some factors that might be somewhat modifiable, such as um, uh, weight status. And so some of those risks include an increased risk for um, placental disorders and preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, um, preterm birth and um, low gestational weights. And so the literature is emerging around how best to intervene and risk reduce. And I think starting that early, right with your initial infertility visit or with your gynecologist or PCP, if you do have this diagnosis is gonna set you for success across um, your, your lifetime. There are several support groups online. I've just listed two that can really help with um, patients who are um, either suspecting they might have a diagnosis of PCOS or who have been given a diagnosis and wanna learn more. Um, there are, um, these two websites really are um, inspirational and might help you on your journey of understanding your um, own cycle regularity and what you can do. I just wanted to end with a few slides on research that is occurring in the PCOS space. And this is, comes from some of my own work in my um, lab, which is based out of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, as well as at the Mass General Fertility Center. And we're trying to build tools that identify those women at risk, interfacing with menstrual tracking applications, um, and hope to share some of that with you in the future. Um, it's also important to identify risk um, in people that come into the hospital. So they may or may not have a diagnosis and, and to understand who gets the diagnosis and how they're counseled is another important um, question I'm asking. Um, I'd like to understand more about what are the prenatal and environmental exposures that are linked to developing an ovulation disorder if you didn't start out with one. And, and what about in the prenatal time window um, how can we reduce risk across the lifespan in terms of that? And finally, what are the best treatment options um, depending on individual patients' goals to health optimize um, across the lifespan? I have um, two studies um, that I wanted to share. One is called the Ovulation and Menstruation Health Study. It's currently in the data analysis phase. And another study is called the Apple Women's Health Study, which is enrolling um, and, and is, um, inclusive of um, anybody who menstruates and is age 18 or years or older with um, an iPhone and you can navigate to the study through um, the um, app store on your phone searching for Apple research. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, here are some references. I'm happy to share these with you and take your questions. Um, thank you so much to the team at Resolve New England and for the invitation to talk with you and um, discuss polycystic ovary syndrome and fertility, what patients need to know. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon.